So it's very good to see you all uh, in this wonderful Advantage India conclave number four. After uh, being in Kolkata, Bangalore, Chennai, we are now here in Delhi. Dr. Kalam used to say that, uh, you know, you should always thank uh, before you start. You know, usually people reserve thanks for the end. So let me first thank uh, Vini and Rakesh, who's not here, Rakesh is in the US, but they're the co-founders of IM Network, bringing a lot of IM and other alumni from uh, very good places together and promoting startups. Uh, I must also thank uh, Vivek and Akshay. Uh, where's Akshay? Ach Akshay is there, reading something. This guy is getting married in 13 days. So wonderful that, uh, from Invite My Guest, they are both co-founders of that. Uh, I must thank all the guests who have come uh, uh, and some of them have actually, you know, changed their flights and schedules. Mr. Jayan Krishna is here, he's the CEO of NSDC. He was supposed to go to Lucknow, but then I made him not go to Lucknow. Uh, you know, probably he would have gone yesterday. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, uh, Dr. Kamal has come all the way from Bombay last night, late. I got to know that. So thanks for all of you. Thanks for all of you uh, coming here. Uh, thanks to the team who's managing our AV, our hotel staff. So that's a bit of a departure. Dr. Kalam always said, thank beforehand, you know, thanks should come first. Today's uh, agenda is very important. Today's agenda is important because we are discussing on political system and governance. We've got people from uh, various walks of life, uh, entrepreneurs, people in the government, people who have been in corporate, have been back to, uh, have been then in government and people who have been in government and then become uh, into uh, corporates. Uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't know whether you are on social media, but I kind of belong to the generation which often has more than one account on social media. Uh, the other day I was reading something about uh, Thomas Friedman. Thomas Friedman is a very famous author, an economist. I happened to meet him uh, uh, sometime way back though. Now, Thomas Friedman writes on his social media about his childhood and today. Thomas he says that when he was a child in 1970s, his mother used to tell him that, uh, you know, Thomas, you finished the food on your plate. You finished the food on your plate because there's a child in India who's going hungry to bed. 1970s. A lot of you were children in 1970s. And a lot of you have parents who were born in probably way before 1970s. So, you know, uh, we've, we've got a very diverse mix. But in 1970s, this is what the reputation of India was. Thomas, finish the food in your plate because there's a child in India who's going hungry to bed. And Thomas now says, Thomas Friedman, he says, I've got my grandchildren. And I tell my eight-year-old grandchild that you girl, you finish your homework. Because if you don't do your homework, there's a child in India who will take away your job. So, you know, this is the... This is the mark of respect. Whether you call it respect, whether you call it fear, whether there's a mix of it, I do not know. But there's something which the world sees in India. And yet we know our contradictions. Now for the demographic dividend we talk about, there are close to 1,100 children who, your post, 1,100 children who die out of diarrhea. That's like four jets crashing every day. That's like a jet crashing every six hours, full of children affected by diarrhea. Nowhere in the world it happens. For one state. But that's the largest state. That state itself is a country of 22 crore people. You, you know, for, for all the wealth and GDP, third largest GDP, PPP terms, we also have a black economy which is almost rivaling our GDP. We have, as we speak, we have train full of water traveling between cities which are parched. Latur. This is India's contradiction, isn't it? From the time I started this speech to the time I end this, my assuming 20, 25 minutes, two farmers would have committed suicide. 
in the richest, most of them would be in the richest state of this country, in Maharashtra. The number one GDP state, number one GSDP state, every 25 minutes, a farmer commits suicide. And this is India's contradiction. And a lot of it emanates because it's a democracy. There's no system as powerful as the political system, as the governance, as the, as the three-layer democracy. And often we just think democracy has two layers, you know, the state and the central government. But the biggest and the most pertinent democracy is actually the third layer of democracy, which is the local self-government bodies, which nobody cares about. Like, when did you last know of a Panchayat Pradhan? You see, a lot of what is heard, a lot of what will be said on these platforms, what you will hear, what you will understand, what you will debate and question today, would be things which may classi be classified as improbable, you know, improbable ideas, can't work. But it's the improbable ideas which transform. So be, you know, what I, uh, because this is the first kind of, the, this is the opening lecture, I want you to open the mind first to improbabilities. Because this country is uh, an improbable country, to be, to be honest, right? A country which on its currency note has to type 15 different languages for that to stay together as a country, as a democracy, is improbable. That's what, we, that's what they said. 20 years they gave us. From 1947, they said 1965 India will be over. Less than 20 years. And India was not just not over, but India went over many other countries. It's an improbability that a country which had about 10% educated people and 80% below poverty line gave equal vote to everyone. Improbable. It was improbable that a man who's known for independence was a man who fought with non-violence. We are all improbable children who most of the world thought will never be born. Then we became improbable infants who the world will thought will never walk. And here we are running. So keep that mind, the Indian mentality, the Indian rigor to embrace the improbable. And all ideas today will sound improbable. You know, a few of the things which our book, Advantage India, the largest chapter, as Dr. Kalam, you know, he, he's a visionary. Dr. Kalam said, the, the, and the way it, the book also came up, the biggest chapter was on political reforms, political and governance reforms, both. That's the biggest chapter. If you have a book, just verify it. And there's a reason for that. Because we believe that this is where the change begins. And a political system or a governance system is not just about some politician sitting in the parliament or, the, or your assembly or even in your panchayat. You are the government. That's what democracy says. We are government. We are the government. And anything which goes wrong, we are responsible for it. Anything which goes right, we can derive credit for it. And think about it. Let me ask you something, you know, let's participate a bit. You know, governance begins with participation. And I'm going to ask you six questions. You can raise your hands, let's be honest, you know, let's leave all the lies to the people on the political system and not here. So let's be honest to it, and I honestly, to begin with, out of the six questions, I have positive answer to only four of them, right, if that soothes. How many of you voted for the 2014 MP elections? Okay, I like the honesty. How many of you know who's your local MP? Your vo registered voter, wherever you are registered, not where you live. Okay, so, so almost the same number of people who voted know who actually won. How many of you voted for the MLA election? It's remarkable that there's almost an overlap of people who voted for the MLA and MP. How many of you know your local MLA? Same people. How many of you voted for the local elections? Three people. <laughs> How many of you know your local representative, the ward promoter, or the mayor? Councillor? Councillor? It depends, it, it, depending on where you are. 
right? So two. So, so I am nothing. So the last two answers, even I am negative. And uh, so I, I know who's the counselor, but I've not voted for him. <laughs> so, so, so the thing is, you know, at some point we have to, and you know, the, uh, in the morning I was reading uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, beautiful poem. He says, when the wounds open, the light enters. When the wounds open, the light enters. I hope I have wounded you enough. Right? We think about it. Now let me give you some statistics. I'm not going to bore you with statistics too much. And I've got only seven minutes, or 10 minutes rather, to finish off. Huh? Um, three minutes. No, I can't have three minutes. I, I just checked it. I also checked with the next speaker. So, <laughs> so yes. So, uh, you know, in the 2004 Lok Sabha, we had 28, 24% people sitting, and the number of MPs remained constant. 24% MPs had serious criminal records against them. In 2009, it became 29%. In 2014, it became 34%. In 2004, the number of MPs who had a crore rupees, at least their net worth, was about 20%. In 2009, it became about 35%. And in 2014, it became, no, in 2009, it became 50%. In 2014, it became 82%. 82%. You have to be a crorepati to become an MP. Elections have become very expensive. And the same figure would be valid for MLAs, believe me. And this is declared income, mind it. So you know how systems work. If 82% MPs are crorepati by, you know, most of you would have at some stage given some competitive exam to get into CAT or some other institution, you know, the likelihood is that, you know, one leads to another. You know, it's a necessary condition. And that is a problem. So one of the ideas which we discussed in the book, and a lot of young people tell, tell us, you know, Dr. Kalam, a lot of people used to tell him, sir, how can I contest election? It is so expensive. You can set an election ceiling, but we all know that it takes crores or rupees to win an election. So for the first improbable idea I want to give you is to debate about and think about the idea of state funding of elections. It costs 30,000 30, crores for the 2014 general elections. 85% of that 30,000 crores were through illegal means. The 15% the came through election commission, the voting process, and the actual ceiling limit within that, you know, expenses. 85% was money which was black. Can we discuss on st state funding of elections? And it's not that we'll be the first country to do it. Many countries, including the developed ones, are doing it. 1.2% 1 1 of the total polled votes, which is about 65 lakh votes, in 2014 elections went on a political symbol called NOTA. Have you heard of NOTA? How many of you voted for NOTA? Did anyone vote for NOTA? Okay, none of the above. <laughs> it's a button now. And more than 65 lakh people voted for NOTA. The problem with NOTA is that nothing happens after NOTA. So even if all the votes go to NOTA, the one who gets even a single vote will win. You know, NOTA has no meaning. And that's why nobody does it. But still, even then, 1.2% of the total election electorate voted for none of the above. Does it not show that we need a new set of aspirants? It's not just a new set of winners. We need a new set of aspirants. Many countries in this world have the system of right to recall. Right to recall was debated in early 2000s when almost all political parties said this is infeasible. Even US has right to recall. You know, if you're, anyone is a famous, uh, you know, if, you, if you like Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he became the governor of California after Gray Davis, who was the governor of California, was recalled by the people, and they replaced him. At some point, accountability has to be ensured. 
as democracies evolve, power goes more and more towards people. You know, it's just ironical, you know, that I was reading the trade deficit of India was $130 billion, right? About 610 was our import, $610 billion, and uh, 130 you subtracted, 470, 480 billion dollars was our export. 130 billion dollars was our trade deficit. Almost every year it happens, more or less. This year it's gone down because of the oil price. And then I was reading that the net worth of all Indians we have exported, you know, the NRIs, is about $650 billion. And, in, in, and by 2018, it will cross a trillion dollars. It will be almost as big as the Indian economy itself of people we have exported. What stops us, you know, the not so exported people, from creating the same kind of opportunities and success? After all, we are the same DNA, right? Same type. Five minutes. Ah, five minutes. Now he's saying, okay. <laughs> So, same type of DNA. What stops us is debatable. India is one of the few well-developed, if you can call us a well-developed economy, at least economically we're doing pretty well, which is still under the system of a British bureaucracy. Think of the best organizations of India. Think of the best organizations. Think. What are you proud of? You're sitting in Delhi. You're proud of DMRC, aren't you? Every Delhi wala is proud of DMRC. Think of the organization Dr. Kalam worked in, ISRO. We are proud of that. Think of every, you think of any government organization which you are really proud of. Invariably, it is led, Amul for example, you know, Amul. It's led by a person who understands what cattle is. DMRC was started and led by a person who knows what civil engineer. He's the best civil engineer you can get, Ishri Dharan. ISRO was started by and still run by people who are space scientists, not bureaucrats. And you pick any organization and they, across the spectrum, small, large, organizations which are, which are led by experts do much better than organizations which are led by generalists. It's time to depart. It's time to really think on that line. And as, since, you know, two minutes are left, have you seen this movie Mowgli? Jungle Book, sorry. Movie is Jungle Book, right? Jungle Book is a beautiful movie. And there's a particular scene, the ones which we have seen uh, would recall, the ones who haven't would know. So there's this river in Jungle Book. This is, uh, all the animals, they, there's this beautiful river. Very, you know, it keeps the jungle happy. Water keeps us happy, right? And then there's this rock in the middle of the river. And every time this rock is visible, which means the water has gone down, the law of the jungle changes. The emergency, like an emergency is imposed. And the emergency is that no animal will attack another animal at a water hole. So if there's a water hole, nobody will attack. So Mowgli asks, I think, who does he ask? Bagheera, I think, I'm not sure. Mowgli asks that, you know, why is that water is being given preference over food? Because nobody can eat food at a water hole. I can't attack a deer at a water hole. So why water has a preference over food? So he gets a reply that because water gives more life than food does, it's more urgent than food does. The rule of the jungle knew where the priorities lie. And sometimes our rule of the political system forgets where our priorities are. And hence, I you know, switch on the television, the kind of debate which happens. And God forbid if you start one of those Rajya Sabha Lok Sabha TVs. The kind of topics which are being discussed, the kind of things which are being discussed within those topics makes me question whether they are the urgent issues. Is the urgent issue to rename a city, not far from here, you know, correction of the name, the name correction which is going to cost 80 to 100 crores, in a city which does not have an ounce of sewage system. Gurgaon never was made to have a sewage system at all. 
Like imagine this is, is that urgent or is the name urgent? And I can tell you across the spectrum, we have somehow lost our need for urgency. And the only people who can bring the right urgency, the right priority in the political discussion is you. Because each one of you is not only the government, you are also a civil society. And that's the most important leg of the Indian democracy, which we need to create. It's very weak. Because one problem which has happened, as I conclude, is that much of our civil society discussions have, in fact, we'll have one of the guests who have exactly done that, much of our civil society has ended in a political cycle. And that has left a vacancy in civil society all the time. I think we need a strong, and that's one of the ideas of the book, we need a very strong civil society. And that will make the priorities appear to the politicians, to the government, to the bureaucracy, so that your voice is not only heard, but somebody does something about your voice. In the end, uh, as I conclude, let me go back to Jalaluddin Rumi, who said, yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Yesterday I was clever, so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise, so I am changing myself. Thank you.